I've designed what I believe to be a fairly unique actuator. It's something that I have not seen anywhere else before, which is not to say it doesn't exist before me, it's just something I haven't seen. This project started out really as just a thought experiment. I was wondering what would happen if you had an actuator in which the output was the sum of two inputs. It's not very uncommon to want to couple the outputs of two motors together. Let's say if I made an electric bike, but it's not quite making it up those steep hills, I might add another motor and then just directly couple the two output shafts to increase my torque. That method of coupling motors, when you just directly connect the two outputs via gears or belts or something like that, that is the standard method to couple motors. You've probably seen this coupling method quite a bit. It doesn't take a genius to figure it out. When you couple motors in this way, the output will have have twice the torque of one of the motors because you've got two motors pushing on it, but it'll have the same max speed as one motor. So the standard coupling mechanism does not result in an output whose rotation speed is the sum of its two inputs. So a motor coupling method that would sum the inputs, though I can explain it pretty simply and clearly, it's a lot less intuitive than it may seem. I can't think of any examples in which you have a mechanism whose output is the sum of its two input speeds except for one. And that would be a car's rear differential. When a car goes around a turn, its rear wheels have to be traveling at different speeds. This is because the outer one is gonna be moving along a longer arc than the inner one. The rear differential is a mechanism that allows both wheels to be powered, but to rotate at different speeds. In fact, it does this by having the two speeds of the individual wheels sum to the engine speed. A rear differential has one input, that is the engine, and two outputs, that is the individual wheels. I want two inputs, that would be my two motors, and then one output. So I need to make a kind of mechanism to emulate a backwards differential. The only issue then is that the rear differential of a car is a pretty complicated mechanism and requires some precise machining. So is there a way in which this can be simplified? Actually, most gearboxes can be used as a simplified differential mechanism. This is a common planetary gear set, I'm sure you're familiar. Generally, you have one input that's on the yellow sun gear at the center, and you have one output that's on the green carrier. But that assumes that the red outer ring is fixed in place. What if it wasn't? Imagine I have one motor driving the sun gear at the center like normal, but then I have a second motor that's driving the outer red ring gear. If they were driving it in opposite directions, you can probably imagine that the net rotation would be zero. In this case, the output is the sum of two input speeds. Granted, the second motor driving the outer ring would need an initial reduction so that it would match the speed of the other motor, but given this, you've effectively created a backwards differential. You have two inputs, and the output speed is the sum of those two inputs. Once I came to the realization that I could manipulate these common mechanisms to be able to create this weird coupling mechanism in which the output is the sum of two inputs, I then began to think about what would this actually do? What would this look like practically? And I generated a handful of hypotheses about what this could do and potential benefits of this mechanism. The first and most obvious hypothesis about this mechanism is that the output maximum rotation speed would be twice that of any individual motor. After all, the entire purpose of this mechanism is to sum two inputs. Um, so that's hypothesis one. I also realized that this alternative coupling system would have some unique properties. Since neither motor is directly attached to each other, the rotation of one does not affect the other in any way. So when the motors are rotating in the same direction, they could sum to give you that output, but if they're rotating in opposite directions, their motions are gonna cancel out and your output will be zero. So even if my motors are running 10,000 RPMs, as long as they're running in the opposite direction and at the exact same speed, the output won't move at all. So my second hypothesis was that when the motors are running in opposite directions at the same speed, that virtual stall torque will have twice the torque of each individual motor. My thought process was that since neither motor is biased in this mechanism, they're both affected the same way, an external torque will be evenly distributed across both. So then my maximum torque is going to be the sum of my two input torques. And then my third and fourth hypotheses extrapolated more on what would happen if you had the motors running in the opposite direction. My third hypothesis was that you would have an additional stall torque increase by around 50%. In a normal motor configuration, the stall torque is when the motor isn't moving at all. It's locked in place. What that means is it's not turning so you can only use two thirds of the coil sets to be able to hold it in place. 
What that then means is that at a stall torque, your motor is using only approximately two thirds of its thermal mass of the stator. In this alternative coupling method, this summing method, the stall torque would be achieved when motors are at speed, which means that over time you're using all three of your, your electromagnet sets, which means you can use the entirety of the thermal mass of your motor stators. That one is a little bit difficult to explain, but hopefully you get the idea. And then finally, my fourth hypothesis was that using this mechanism, you could achieve arbitrarily precise movements without encoder feedback. If a motor has encoder feedback, then it becomes a servo motor and all servo motors have arbitrarily precise movements. So it might not seem that special, but with this mechanism, since the output rotation is this sum of two inputs, if both motors are moving in opposite directions, I could have one motor going say 100 RPMs and the other going 99.9 RPMs. So then the output is 0.1 RPMs, an extremely slow movement. So based off of that logic, without any encoder feedback, just controlling the speeds of my motors, I can achieve arbitrarily slow and thus arbitrarily precise movements on the output. And you wouldn't even need all the fancy and expensive FOC control. So those were my four hypotheses going into this project. And I'll just tell you up front, two of them are totally wrong. And they were naive of me to think from the beginning. I suppose I was overly hopeful, but we'll talk about those wrong hypotheses in a bit. And at this point, I was running into the limits of what I could just intuitively understand and visualize. After all, there's a lot of weird movements and nothing's really directly coupled to each other. So it's hard to really understand this intuitively. So I just went ahead and I built the mechanism so that I could test these things empirically. Unfortunately, there's no build montage for this one. I've actually been working on this project on and off over the past few months. So I decided that I didn't want to have to keep track of a bunch of little clips over that long of a time period. Anyways, here's the CAD model. So here you go, this is the completed mechanism. And I'm not gonna lie, it looks really cool. This mechanism is based around two BLDC motors, which you can't see because they're both inside of these, these uh, circular casings here, but you can see their wires coming out the bottom. Again, this type of motion can be achieved using many different types of mechanisms. I chose to use a cycloidal drive. It's because it's uh, what I'm most familiar with. It's what I've designed most often. So the red parts you see in there, those are cycloidal discs. That's what's doing the primary gear reduction. As you can see, it is symmetric. This side is exactly the same as this side. The only difference is the output parts here. So what's on top on, on either side. I'm calling this side the primary motor and this side the secondary. That's just because the output is more directly coupled to the primary motor than it is the secondary. As with any cycloidal drive, the wobble of each of these discs is driven by the motor itself. Except unlike most cycloidal drives, the outside here is also free to rotate. And there's a timing belt that goes all the way around here. It's tensioned via some bearings in there that couple the outer casings of both of these so that they rotate together. So the primary motor is driving the primary cycloidal gear and the secondary motor via an additional reduction here is driving the outside. There's an eight to one reduction on the primary cycloidal gear and then there's an additional eight to one reduction on driving this outside here. So the result of that is if I hold the secondary motor in place just by holding onto this casing and I rotate the output, the, the motor will rotate at, a, at an eight to one reduction. Then instead of I don't touch the primary, but rotate the secondary by the same amount by rotating this outside, the output will also rotate by that same reduction. So if either motor is held rigidly, one rotation on the opposite motor will yield the same result as if the rolls were switched. And thus you have a mechanism in which the output speed is the sum of its two inputs, except that there is an overall eight to one reduction, uh, which is again, arbitrary, that reduction could be any value. It, it may be overly complicated and have more parts than necessary, but dang, it does look good and it is shiny. In order to drive this actuator, I'm going to be using an O-Drive. For the uninitiated, this is a really high quality FOC motor controller. FOC stands for Field Oriented Control. What that means is that the O-Drive takes uh, positional data from an encoder uh, attached to the, the motor, and then it uses that data to be able to control it in its most efficient way and via really any possible control mode. The O-Drive is also really great for this actuator because it can control two motors at the same time, all on the one board. All right, now it's time to test. Here's my setup. I've got a 24 volt, 20 amp power supply, and that's powering my O-Drive here, which is wired up to 
my actuator, which is bolted here horizontally so I can do some torque testing on it. And then that's wired up to my laptop, which is running the, the Python code to control the O-Drive. Before I start doing the actual testing, I need to do some calibration on these motors. I removed the output from the actuator so that I can calibrate the motors without any resistance. Uh, I should be good to go for the calibration right now. Let's try this out. Oh, it's totally working. It's awesome. My motors are calibrated now and I have full control over their velocity in both directions. So I'm gonna get them turning here. And I can even give them a negative velocity to, to switch their directions. Everything's working out so far, so now I can reattach my output and get to doing some, some real testing. I reattached the output, but I left off one of the tensioners. This allows me to pin up the belt here, which is holding this outer casing rigid. This makes it so that the second motor is negligible and the overall mechanism is just an eight to one reduction of the primary motor. The first test I'll be running is going to be a control test for the stall torque. This slightly modified mechanism is analogous to the other method by which you would use two motors to drive a single output. That's where their outputs would be directly coupled. I pulled out my variable benchtop power supply and I'm gonna use this to run eight amps through my primary motor and I will test the stall torque on that. I'm running eight amps because that's the current limit I have set on my O-Drive for each individual motor. That way when I test the full mechanism, I can make a fair comparison. So as you can see, I attached this lever arm here. This is how I'll be testing the torque. And then I've tied the cap of a water bottle to it. That's this water bottle. So now I can put water in my bottle, screw it on here, and then test it that way. So now I can incrementally add more and more water until the maximum torque is exceeded. So I'll start by turning on my power supply. The lever arm is holding. It can hold that mass so we go up. And I have a second water bottle here to supplement that mass. Oh, there we go. So it seems we've reached our limit there. I can now weigh this mass and measure the lever arm length to be able to calculate the output torque. I've now put the second tensioner back in, uh, so we should be operating normally again. I'm now ready to spin up the motors and we can test the overall output of the complete mechanism. This is not working out great, if you can't tell. Yeah, that was, um, that was less than impressive. That was still a result and it was a telling result at that. As you saw, the testing did not go spectacularly. Uh, there were multiple times that I thought I broke it, but I didn't somehow. And because of the rockiness of that testing procedure, this isn't ending up being the most scientific of testing. I'm not gonna be able to, to compare quantitative results as I would like to, um, but the qualitative results, I think, speak for themselves. In my control test, I was able to hold a pretty considerable torque using just the one motor. But since I wasn't able to test the stall torque of the alternative method, that is the method in which the output is the sum of its two inputs, the exact torque of the first test doesn't really matter. What matters is that it was able to hold a stall torque. Now look back to the second test. This is me testing the mechanism in full in which the output is the sum of two inputs. This alternative coupling method did not go well at all. I mean, you could see that I was not able to hold any kind of stall torque. In fact, the stall torque was so weak that it wasn't even able to hold up that wooden lever arm that I used for torque testing in the first test. So the reason I'm not so worried about comparing quantitative results is that in the first test, I could see that it did in fact hold a stall torque. Um, that was the control test. And then in the second test, which was my new mechanism, this alternative coupling mechanism, it wasn't really able to hold any stall torque, even under a really small load. So what does this mean? Why did this happen? Well, it disproves my second and third hypothesis. Remember, my second hypothesis was that the output torque would be the sum of the two input torques. And then my third hypothesis was that this mechanism would have an increased power density under a stall torque, thus increasing the stall torque by a maximum of like 50%. So then both of these have to be wrong or at least inconsequential because as you could see, it could barely hold anything. So that's all fine, but the bigger question is why? Um, why was I so wrong? 
Well, it's all actually pretty obvious. And again, I was pretty naive to think otherwise. The day before I ran these tests, I went through one final thought experiment about this mechanism. And that thought experiment was what would happen if one of the motors had infinite torque? So that's like if the motor was just locked into place, it couldn't move at all. Well, since the two motors are not directly coupled to each other, the second one would still be able to rotate and the output would still be able to rotate. In the case in which one of the motors is rigidly held in place, so effectively infinite torque, the output will still be overloaded at the same point that the one other motor is overloaded. This is to say that when you're looking at a stall torque, it doesn't matter what the interaction of the two motors is. What matters is the weakest link. Even if one is infinite torque, if the other is exhibiting less torque, then it's going to fail at that point. And this is really something that I should have realized um, months ago when I started to think about this. But here we are, you live, you learn. And the other explanation for this super low stall torque when the motors are at speed comes from just a simple power calculation. The power of a motor in watts can be calculated by the rotation speed of that motor times its torque. So then for a given motor power, the torque and the speed are inversely related. So when I have those motors, they were running in the tests around 600 RPMs. Because they were rotating so fast, their maximum torque is really low just because of that simple equation. So even if the output was the sum of the two input torques, which I don't believe is the case, it would still be extremely low because when they're at speed, they have low torque. So using this mechanism, if you are looking for a high uh, stall torque, you would not rev them up to, to full speed or anything. You would just lock them in place like any other motor you're trying to stall. There is an even more intuitive way to understand the behavior of this mechanism despite it being kind of complex. Think about the standard method by which to couple the outputs of two motors that is directly attaching their outputs. In that mechanism, as compared to only using one of its motors, the output will have twice the torque, but the same speed. But in this alternative method, again, in which the output is the sum of two input speeds, it's the opposite. Compared to one of the motors, the torque will be the same, but the maximum output speed will be double. And that just makes sense. You do it one way, you get twice the torque, but same speed. You do it this other way, you get twice the speed, but the same torque. So in conclusion, uh, this mechanism did not meet my highest hopes, but of course it didn't. I was thinking about it all wrong initially. Um, but that is certainly not to say that, that this mechanism, this alternative coupling method is useless. It's just very different from what people are usually used to. I'll remind you there still are two useful benefits of using this coupling method. First, the output has twice the maximum speed of each input, so if you're looking for higher speed in your system, then this could be useful. And two, you can achieve arbitrarily precise movements without any encoder feedback. So speed and precision is where this mechanism can shine. As an example, I think that something like a 3D printer could be an application for this. Generally, 3D printer motors don't require a lot of torque. Instead, you're more interested in speed so you can get your print done. So this actuator could help out there. It could also get you, again, arbitrarily precise movements with stepper motors. With this mechanism, you wouldn't need an FOC servo conversion for every one of your stepper motors, which can be somewhat expensive. Uh, to get that arbitrarily precise movements in your system. You can instead just use two stepper motors and control their speeds relative to each other to control the output to infinitely exact amounts. And my design can absolutely be improved upon. Again, you can use really any kind of mechanism. I chose cycloidal drives arbitrarily. You very easily could have designed this with planetary gearboxes. Um, and my design was overly complex and it could have been simplified significantly. I would love to see other people's iterations of this and improvements upon my, uh, my theory, I guess. But if you are interested in the CAD files I use for this project or are just wanting to help me out and support future projects, you can do so via Patreon. There will be a link for that in the description. I've recently been getting a lot of support on Patreon, which is helping me get new tools and new camera gear and stuff like that. You can also join my Discord server and talk to me and other engineering minded people, uh, talk about projects, get help on projects, stuff like that. There will also be a link for that in the description. And you can also follow me on Instagram. I'm going to try and start posting more uh, regular updates on projects and stuff on there. I know I've been lacking in the past. This project has been months in the making. It's been really fun. Again, I'd really love to see everyone else's improvements on this design. I appreciate you being here. I appreciate your support. Um, that's all I have for now. So, bye.